In the intricate world of human genetics, Dr. Typhon Özçelik stands as a beacon of innovation and discovery. His pioneering endeavors in mapping human genome to both human and mouse chromosomes have unveiled the profound complexities and mesmerizing patterns within our genetic code, offering invaluable insights into the traces of diseases embedded within specific human genes. Dr. Özçelik's astute understanding of the challenges associated with identifying genes linked to conditions like neurodegeneration and obesity underscores the multifaceted nature of genomics and the hurdles that lie in translating, gen translating genetic data into tangible medical solutions. His recent groundbreaking studies, especially the intriguing connection between CRY1 gene, ADHD, and sleep phase disorders are a testament to his ability to unearth novel genetic links and their implications for human health. Beyond the sheer scientific prowess, Dr. Özçelik's dedication to the field is palpable in every endeavor, from meticulous research processes to the thought-provoking questions he raises about the future of genomics. As we delve deeper into this enlightening conversation, let us celebrate the brilliance and unwavering commitment of a researcher who is truly redefining the boundaries of genetic research and its potential impact on humanity. He is also a very good faculty president changing the education. Here is our conversation. Welcome to the Spectrum of Science. question is, you have been to Munich and then Yale and Harvard Hughes studying physiology and you returned to Turkey and brought what you have learned to Turkey. What influenced your decision? Did you always knew you were going to going back to Turkey or something changed along the way? Uh, okay. Uh, as a student, high school student, let me give you a general answer. Yeah. As a high school student, uh, I was uh, very much interested in actually life sciences. First, I thought that I would be uh, interested in uh, political sciences. Yeah. But uh, when we uh, learned about uh, biology in the last year, uh, that was a fascinating subject for me. Yeah. And uh, what to do for the next... Uh, stage of my uh, career, uh, I thought uh, medical school uh, would be a good uh, option uh, for me. Because at that time there was no uh, program in uh, molecular biology and uh, genetics. And uh, uh, while I was a, a student at uh, Istanbul Medical School, I uh, realized uh, that uh, there can be two different paths for me. Uh, one is to be the valedictorian of my uh, class, yeah. uh, and second, uh, to uh, be engaged in uh, research as early as possible. And at that time, uh, I thought uh, there are uh, valedictorians every year, so uh, if I would be able to write a paper uh, as a student, that would be uh, more valuable. Of course. That's what how I thought. And I also realized that I should break the uh, ice between a student and a mentor. I mean, a teach the concept of a teacher and a student. You know, it's like they are on the two sides of a table, but we should be on the same side, like colleagues. Mm -hmm. So... So, uh, and this means that, of course, uh, uh, finding a mentor for yourself. And this is not always uh, a uh, logical, you know, well-planned, uh, meticulously planned process. You just, as a student, go and what your gut feeling tells you. So I identified a mentor for myself and uh, went to her. Uh, this is Nurangyo Khan uh, at Istanbul Medical School. 
and uh, she accepted me. So starting from the second year uh, in the medical school, mm -hmm. uh, I was engaged in uh, research. Yeah. Uh, and uh, luckily, uh, this resulted in a, a publication uh, when I was a, a fourth year uh, student uh, in the uh, medical school. And uh, at the same time, I realized that uh, in order to be at the forefront of uh, science, uh, I should be uh, educated in the best possible places. Istanbul Medical School was an excellent place. Uh, I'm not uh, implying that the medical school was not good enough. <laughs> but to um, increase my uh, uh, interaction with the world, I, I should say, I started writing to different medical schools uh, and uh, eventually during my clinical years, uh, uh, meaning the, the pediatrics and uh, internal medicine and uh, surgery and OBGYN and other types of uh, rotations, mm -hmm. I went to uh, different universities in Europe, in yeah. Switzerland and in the uh, UK uh, to be specific. Uh, and uh, finally to US. And this was a unique experience uh, for me. And uh, I, uh, what I want to do next step in my career also crystallized at that point. And I uh, was uh, pretty well convinced that I'm interested in uh, genetics more than uh, anything else. Uh, but the circumstances I started with, uh, as you mentioned, uh, physiology at uh, Munich uh, University, uh, Ludwig Maximilian University of München. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, after doing my doktorarbeit uh, in uh, physiology, I switched back to uh, human genetics and went to Yale University. Uh, and uh, this was the medical scientist training program of Yale uh, University, where we had about 25% uh, clinical and uh, Seventy-five percent uh, laboratory uh, involvement. Uh, after that uh, training at Yale, uh, I moved to uh, Stanford University, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, mm -hmm. uh, where I spent a few more uh, years uh, studying human uh, genes and mapping them to human and mouse uh, chromosomes, which led to the uh, identification of several disease-associated genes, to be specific, yeah. Prader-Willi syndrome, and uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, neuropathy, and uh, glycogen storage uh, disorder. And throughout this time, uh, I had my family ties uh, still very uh, strong uh, back at home, yes, and uh, though uh, we had the um, the chance of uh, pursuing a career in the U.S. Uh, following these uh, uh, training uh, periods, uh, I decided to uh, come back to Turkey. And I was very lucky because um, I uh, got a, a grant from the U United Nations Development Fund and World Health Organization to start uh, a molecular genetics lab, uh, the, one of the first examples of uh, molecular labs in uh, Turkey, yeah. and uh, this is how I uh, returned back to our country. I see, I see. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the crystallization of the research topics that you actually are going to do research on? How did that happen? How did you choose? How did it crystallize really? Uh, uh, certainly. Uh, so, one of the my mentor, uh, Nuran Gökhan, was a really uh, nice uh, lady. And uh, working with her on uh, physiology as a, a medical uh, student, I was exposed to uh, cutting the concept of cutting-edge research. Because research can be done in many different fields, but what is a really frontiers of research type investigation, uh, 
is uh, something uh, different. Okay. And uh, and uh, also, at the same time, during my uh, visits, especially to Oxford University in the UK, I was continuously uh, going to the uh, libraries uh, of the institutions and reading uh, uh, papers. And while uh, reading papers, I uh, discovered that there are actually two uh, very important uh, journals. Now, it's still, it's, they are very important, uh, namely Nature and Science. Yeah. And Nature and Science uh, journals don't only publish uh, original research work, but they have a lot of uh, opinion pieces and editorials uh, and news and views uh, type of uh, articles. And I started reading them. Actually, uh, I used to go uh, on Saturday mornings mm -hmm. to the library and until 3, 4 uh, o'clock uh, in the uh, afternoon, uh, read these journals. <laughs> this gave me a, a, an uh, understanding of uh, where science is headed towards. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, I also discovered that I'm not really interested in, say, uh, surgery, Mm -hmm. or other types of uh, clinical uh, disciplines where you take care of the uh, patients as your uh, focal uh, interest. Yeah. But that I would, I'm rather uh, better in, in the lab, in, yeah. research, in, in, in research. I love to uh, investigate uh, things and um, try to understand uh, the nature of uh, things. Mm -hmm. And this is first uh, basic research, uh, second, I saw that, uh, you know, this was the just before the uh, initiation of the Human Genome Project. Yeah. Uh, but uh, cloning was a, a mainstay of uh, genetics uh, research. Identification of disease-associated genes had begun in uh, major centers around the world. And uh, I thought uh, this is an excellent area for me, uh, and this is uh, how I uh, how um, it crystallized uh, in my mind. And to this day, uh, I'm really uh, happy that I chose uh, human genetics yeah, as I my field, field of study. study. I can definitely tell. Um, what made you fall in love with biology at the first place? You said. Uh, in the last year of high school, I started being interested, but how did that happen? Really? Yeah, definitely. So, um, of course, uh, we had family friends, my parents, and uh, one of them was late uh, Altan Günay uh, from Hacettepe Medical School, mm -hmm. and he introduced me to the uh, 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 concept of uh, um, uh, these are the early years of uh, very early years of molecular biology, yeah. and I saw uh, Jim Watson's book uh, on uh, this subject. Jim Watson is the person who discovered the DNA molecule together yeah. with uh, 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 Crick. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, the the topics that we cover uh, in biology, specifically, actually the genetic aspects of the biology classes, mm -hmm. uh, I just fell in love uh, with the subject. Yeah, I see, I see. And you also said, and I know that from researching you a little bit, you started in medical school, but now that doesn't really have to be the case to study what you study. Uh, do you see the influences of the two types of coming uh, here to do the research that you do? In the in terms in the yeah I hear this uh, I hear this question a lot yeah. and I think this is a, a legitimate uh, question so uh, if I I think here uh, I mean, you're asking uh, whether to start with a molecular biology and genetics mm -hmm. and then do research or to start with a medical education and then do molecular biology yes, and exactly. genetics and you know. 
they are both possible. So, uh, but uh, which one is better? So here, I think the most important thing is uh, whether you want to practice as a medical doctor. Do you okay. like to take care of individual patients, solve their medical problems, uh, and help them in improving the quality of their lives on an individual basis? If this is what you want to do, then certainly as I would recommend a student uh, to go into the medical school. Okay. However, if your interesting interest is in asking questions and trying to find answers to them, then it is very important to learn scientific thinking, the scientific approach, mm -hmm. uh, creative thinking, at the same yes, time, of course. and in this respect, a, a undergraduate education in uh, molecular biology and genetics in a basic science field, actually, and then uh, complementing it with a, a PhD on the subject uh, uh, would be, I think, a better approach. Okay, let's say there is a student in medical school who wants to do research in molecular biology. What is the advice for them, and what is the advice for molecular biology students other than doing a doctorate on a specific subject? You see, there are excellent scientists who come from the medical <coughs> schools. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Nobel laureates uh, who had a uh, training in MD. Uh, MD training is also uh, uh, giving you a formation of uh, digesting uh, tons of uh, knowledge at the same time. But also, in medicine, the prime focus, the, the focus is uh, practicing your profession in the most uh, comprehensive and perfect way. This quest for perfection mm -hmm. may sometimes negatively affect critical and uh, creative thinking. It's something else. Yeah. So long as a person who realizes this and breaks away from perfect perfect um, mm, conduct of the uh, business based on existing information. This is the key part. Then uh, either way is uh, possible. Uh, in, of course, in research you have to be a perfectionist uh, still, uh, mm -hmm. a critic of your uh, own work, uh, which is something totally uh, uh, different. But uh, so uh, I think this is the main difference uh, between a medical education again and a molecular biology or, or a scientific education in general. So in medical school or even MBG, uh, sometimes students uh, lose their curiosity uh, due to some circumstances and other things. Did you have such a time or um, overall how did you protect that curiosity towards molecular biology and sciences? Yeah, this is also a very, uh, I think, uh, relevant critical question. and. Uh, I think, uh, after all these years, I come to the conclusion uh, that uh, you have to be an intrinsically positive person. Yes. Yes. It comes from within. Mm -hmm. And there will always be difficulties. 
and therefore uh, you should uh, not be discouraged. In fact, Alfred Nobel, in his biography, mm -hmm. says there are four, five critical factors for uh, uh, building up a culture of creativity, which is central to scientific process. These are, number one, study-oriented home environment. Number two, good schooling. Number three, growing up in a cosmopolitan environment. This means that you are not in an isolated little village on the <laughs> uh, uh, far away yeah. on a far away place, but you live in a city, or, and or I mean, it doesn't mean that you are not going to become uh, creative if you are from a village. No, no, but it helps if you are in a cosmopolitan environment. Yeah, I see what you exposure to frontiers of you don't have to do research yourself, but you need to be exposed to. Yes. Frontiers of research to have an understanding of that. That was nature and science for you, I guess. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And five perseverance. Yes. So and perseverance includes both uh, working diligently and very long hours. There is no such thing as things will happen by themselves. It takes, uh, you know, a lot of uh, commitment and hard work. I remember, still, not as much, but I remember working uh, at least uh, eight to 90 hours per week. Uh, yeah. And still, now, uh, I... Uh, work from 8 a.m. till uh, 10 p.m. I mean, if there is something, yes. uh, and uh, weekends, uh, Saturday included. Uh, so, this is how, uh, of course, lastly, when you have all of these come together. Uh, if you don't have luck, still, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it doesn't work. So the inspiration, perspiration ratio, you need to perspire 99%, but if the 1% inspiration is not there, nothing happens. So um, this is this question is more about genetics, about the discussion of genetics really, not about the research. But the question is, how far do you think we can go with genetics? Um, how much prediction power does it give you about a person after all those years filled with genetics research? What can you tell about that? You know, um, life sciences uh, has gained a lot of momentum uh, during the past few decades. Uh, this is like also uh, physics. Uh, when you go back to the uh, beginning of the previous century, the advances, scientific advances, I mean, like uh, Einstein, Bohr, and others. Uh, yeah, great who uh, understood the uh, basics of matter, relativity, and so on, led to the nuclear age. Mm -hmm. The understanding of the three-dimensional structure of DNA at the uh, middle of the century, mm -hmm. leading to the human genome project and the associated projects, mm -hmm transformed life sciences and medicine fundamentally. We are now living, we are in the uh, age of molecular and genetic medicine. So, 
for the future predictions that is a uh, difficult uh, I think uh, attempt but uh, I can say uh, that the language of genomics uh, will be at the center of medicine it is already moving into the center of medicine and it will be even more so at the center of uh, medicine uh, in the uh, coming years. We now uh, witness this in the field of diagnostics, diagnosing different diseases based on DNA analysis. This will grow more and more. In addition, having a knowledge about the molecular basis of a health condition in humans automatically leads to targeting at a molecular level different uh, pathways which means there will be ever increasing number of drugs to treat diseases based on the genetic information so uh, this I can uh, predict I know the also the uh, really uh, contentious issues. Uh, so, uh, using of recombinant DNA technology to alter the germline is a very uh, uh, debated and uh, actually there is also uh, a, a universal consensus on this matter in mm -hmm. all uh, arenas uh, like the scientific field or policymakers and everyone uh, we should not uh, touch the germline I mean uh, designer babies as it is mm -hmm. uh, called uh, or uh, altering the germline of a person uh, independent um, forever uh, will change the genetic structure uh, of a living uh, species in this case humans mm -hmm. so these are more uh, ethical uh, questions, I think, that the uh, society uh, needs to uh, discuss and be extremely careful in moving uh, forward. Yes, of course. Um, but the question, the second question was kind of more about, let's say, you're, you have been given a gene, the whole genome of a person, um, how much can you predict just by looking at that? You can predict some diseases that the person might experience, but what more? Okay, I got your question. So let me tell you, let me answer it as clearly as I can. Okay. Now, we inherit half of our genome from our mothers and the other half from our fathers. Yes. When we have mutations in genes as they come from our parents, mm -hmm. we have inherited disorders. Yes. All of the inherited disorders are genetic. But not all genetic disorders are inherited. Yes. This means we inherit a genome and on average any one of us, anyone in the population, go ahead and pick up one of your friends, in anyone, has a number of mutations. None of us are born uh, perfect. But let's consider it is as close as possible to perfection. Mm -hmm. Still, once we become a zygote, then an entire individual, we are exposed to environmental factors. Yeah. Ionizing radiation, mm -hmm. uh, too much sunlight, 
smoking cigarettes, unhealthy uh, eating uh, habits, yeah. uh, not exercising, and all of these factors take their toll on our DNA. Yes. So there are, number one, inherited mutations that come from our parents, and here we have the mutations that we accumulate in our bodies mm -hmm. during our lifetime. Yes. We can predict the first group, mm -hmm. the inherited mutations. What you inherit from your parents, that is now predicted. It is possible. It is a first-line diagnostic testing, meaning mm -hmm. just like you go to take your X-ray or uh, MR scan or blood count, you can also have your DNA sequenced and all your mutations can be documented. Yes. But still, you can be sick, you have a perfect uh, gene sequence for tumor suppressor genes, so you have zero chance of uh, getting cancer. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you smoke two packs of cigarettes every day <laughs> yeah. and lead an unhealthy life. But the, and for 40 years, at the end of these 40 years, although you began with perfect sets of genes, you mutate them during your lifetime and therefore the individual gets cancer. That is, so these are two different things. Yeah, and one definitely affects this, this is a certain thing. But after we are just born, uh, our, we might be able to tell just by looking at the DNA after environment, our environmental stimuli comes what kind of a thing we will do, how we will react. Will we smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, for example, or uh, will, we, will we be too rushy and get into a car accident, maybe? Can we predict such things in the end? You think I? Of course, you can't do it now, but in the end, uh, probabilistically, you can predict, but not based on DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. Let me divide your question into two. You okay. said, "Can we predict a cancer? Can we predict a, an accident?" In the case of an accident, mm -hmm. if that person has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Yeah, I know that paper of yours, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is an, actually a genetic disorder, it's an inherited disorder. <laughs> and if, the, if, if an individual has ADHD, mm -hmm. then he or she is automatically prone to accidents. Yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> <laughs> there is a sort of, not exactly, but a sort of, Determinism. Mm -hmm. In the case of cancer, of course, uh, one cannot say for sure that uh, the person who is smoking two packs of cigarettes will eventually uh, develop yeah. cancer. This is not 100%. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there is a very high probability. It can be uh, 80% uh, or uh, even higher uh, than that. What makes it probabilistic in your case? Um, because in the atomic scale, of course, there's some uncertainty, but when you look at the cell, it seems to be more um, higher scale, at least, to avoid the probabilistic stuff that atomic stuff has. So what, in your case, gets the probabilistic, I don't know, uncertainty or the probabilistic nature? of the cell, for example. Okay. Mutations are not... Uh, uh, mutations occur randomly. Yes. Therefore, since mutations occur randomly, they don't always hit critical genes. They hit just... After all, let me tell you something. Only 
percent of our genome corresponds to genes. 98%, more than 98% of our genome, it is still ATC, GGCT, AGCT, the same nucleotides, but it yes. doesn't correspond to a gene. And mutations do not specifically go after the genes. They, they, they just hit the DNA. Okay, yeah. So therefore, even if you have a genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't lose a critical set of genes by mutations, you don't get the disease. That's the probabilistic uh, uncertainty. That leads me to another question. Um, that 98% you mentioned, uh, do you think all of them has some sort of functionality or is it just some of it is just inefficient engineering of DNA spark? Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, a lot of people think about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, once it was called as the junk DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, junk is a type of trash <laughs> yeah. that you cannot throw away. Mm -hmm. uh, but later, when the Human Genome Project was conducted, and the sequence became available to all, all of us. Mm -hmm. The basic notion in biology is, in DNA, if something is functionally important, that something is conserved throughout evolution. Yes. Meaning, if you take a human, if you take a cow, if you take a cat, a dog, uh, a, a bee, and any, any organism, mm -hmm. That gene is present in all these uh, uh, creatures, the living uh, organisms. And they are conserved. Meaning, insulin, your insulin, my insulin, yes, but the cat also has insulin. The dog also has yeah. insulin. <laughs> you can see insulin all the way back to yeast, wow. single cell organism. Yes. And junk DNA appeared to be uh, not so well conserved. Mm -hmm. But then scientists identified portions of non-genic, not a gene, yeah. DNA, yeah. that are even more conserved than uh -huh. genes. So um, what does it mean? We don't understand it right now. But error correction is possibly universal, that means? Yeah, I mean, they are conserved in throughout the species. Yeah. So this means that what we call as junk mm -hmm. certainly has a function yes. that we are only scratching the surface mm -hmm. uh, as we uh, speak today. So in this respect, actually, there are uh, long-acting regulatory elements. Meaning, uh, the genes, the genes need to make proteins. Yes. And these, the this business of making a protein mm -hmm. is controlled by different mechanisms in the genome. Yes. And these, now we are discovering that non-genic portions of the DNA contain sequences that govern on these uh, genes for their expression profile. So, and some also say that, uh, you know, of course, the genome has accumulated uh, a lot of uh, pseudogenes. These pseudogenes are, are relics of the past uh, evolution. Oh, uh, so there's also that portion. Then, uh, of course, uh, it is probably more advantageous for the organism to increase the size of the genome mm -hmm. so that the target is hidden. You know, the really valuable parts are hidden in a big chunk of DNA. So when a mutation hits, it hits a non-consequential uh, portion of the genome. Yeah, so possibly there could be some non-important bits, but we don't actually know 
Yeah, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, imagine I imagine some sort of group studying uh, studying molecular biology and genetics, and uh, they are undergraduate graduate now. What is the recommendation for them, other than taking all the lectures they can and seeing, doing internships everywhere and yeah, what else? Oh, okay. Um, so, in, uh, students uh, need to understand as early as possible that they need to build up their career. Yes. And this is a step by step process. Usually there is no elevator that takes you there. <laughs> yes. So you take the steps one by one. So in this regard, actually, uh, students should be aware that uh, they are learning to forget things. It is entirely natural really? to forget. But when you are learning, you learn how to think and how to pursue information, retrieve the information when you need it to get it back. Yes. So this is a critical, uh, I think, uh, skill. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And it's not mentioned a lot. So thank you. Yeah. This is one. The other thing is, of course, uh, uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, this is also extremely uh, important uh, to develop, of course, soft skills mm -hmm. at the same time is uh, critically uh, important. And a career building process is a hard ball game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are a lot of numbers involved. Yes. So you should be always well trained and also on the field to play the game. Yeah. Never give up. Don't let others say how bad you are. I'll tell you a mathematical formula which is proven to be uh, always correct. This is Whatever the number is, it can be one, it can be uh, ten, it can yeah. be million, billion, zillion, whatever the number is. Yeah. If you multiply it with zero, the oh, net yeah. result is zero. <laughs> yes, yes. So, life attempts to multiply you with zero on many different occasions. Oh, yeah. yeah. How do you overcome those? Uh, there are different ways. There is no one formula. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I think uh, it uh, starts with uh, inner strength. It has to be in you. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, hard work and uh, sometimes when the situation requires you don't take any action. Mm -hmm. Pacifism is the best uh, <laughs> approach. <laughs> Something, sometimes you need to be uh, active, active uh, yeah. about it. So, <clears throat> so it is, there is no uh, muhasebe, muhakeme kabiliyeti olarak. Mm -hmm. This is what we say in uh, <laughs> Turkish. Uh, you should have the uh, foresight to evaluate things actively mm -hmm. and take your actions accordingly yeah, for course. each person. And of course, it is always very good to have friends in life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they may not need. They may not need to be uh, many friends, but uh, good friends 
good colleagues and uh, of also uh, having an international uh, 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 view or uh, international dimension okay. of your work uh, also helps a lot. Of course. So uh, you are the dean of our um, molecular biology and genetics um, field of study. Uh, what can you tell about that? How is it? How is it like being a dean of a of an academic school? And how difficult is it? How tiring is it? Let me tell you, it is a very gratifying uh, job. Uh, I'm uh, proud to be uh, uh, together with uh, such a good uh, collection of uh, uh, colleagues here and also uh, uh, students uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, our most valuable, uh, yeah. actually. Uh, and they really love you too. Uh, I, I mean, they are very ex excellent uh, students, so it is very gratifying. In this, in my personal case, uh, actually, uh, I'm still uh, involved uh, with uh, research. I have a research group, so yeah. I have graduate students, mm -hmm. and I try to write uh, papers and uh, so on. So, uh, so then, of course, we know that an uh, academic uh, versus administrative duties yes. are not always compatible with each other. Yes. Uh, I try to uh, balance this uh, by removing all the nonsense from my life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There are lots of those hits. A lot of nonsense for us. Mm -hmm. So I always believe in, uh, I believe in individual creativity. Yes. At the same time, I believe in teamwork. These are compatible things. Mm -hmm. So as a dean, actually, my colleagues, my secretaries, uh -huh. are the <laughs> deans here. Yeah. They, they deal with all the daily uh, things. They always tell me, of course, I have to sign all the uh, papers and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, this is how it goes. So uh, one very important thing is uh, every morning as I wake up mm -hmm. and I come here, I come happy. And I come excited. I'll see my students. I'll see my uh, colleagues. And so this also makes a big, big difference. Yeah, definitely being happy should help, should help a lot. Um, what, what, kind of, um, what kind of a feature do you imagine for molecular biology and genetics field? And also, what kind of a work will you do as a dean uh, to make the life of students, students easier and more prosperous, I guess, more creative? Um, and what did you do before that you can advise others? So, uh, I uh, this year we conducted a, a comprehensive uh, study, actually. And uh, in this uh, study, we systematically analyzed all of our graduates yes. over the last 33 years. Mm -hmm. So we reached to 2,500, 2,489, I think, 2,500 mm -hmm. graduates. That's perfect. And we got responses from 95% of them. So this it's is a, a good record. It's a good ratio. Yeah. It's, a, it's a healthy Mm -hmm. ratio. The reason the faculty of, you know, the name Wilkent mm -hmm. comes from William Kent, yes. City for Science. Yes. So, <laughs> we give the uh, name to this universe. Science mm -hmm. is the name of this universe, mm -hmm. and we are the faculty of science. So, in this respect, mm -hmm. uh, actually, we have uh, two main missions. One is to uh, conduct excellent research, and the other is to uh, educate the next generation of scientists. Yes. So two missions. Mm -hmm. 
And what we have seen is what? 92% of our graduates continue their careers. Employment ratio is 92%. Yes. Yes. Which that's is the best good, good ratio. That's sure. a very good ratio. <laughs> yes. Even more importantly, 60% of our graduates are in academia. Yeah, it's even better. So. Oh, that's even. And the 30 percent, they are in excellent places in terms of the private sector, and three percent are in government, and three percent are in uh, education. So this is yeah, a really collective, yes. collective uh, effort of the whole faculty of science. Now, on top of that, we have incredible success stories. Our graduates are transforming science as we speak. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Yes. So, actually, you can see this in our web page, all this information. Okay. And during the 33 years since the establishment of the Faculty of Science, mm -hmm. Bill Kent, Faculty of Science, also produced groundbreaking uh, science. We have these examples. That's true. So, I think uh, this is very uh, significant, and we can only hope to continue like this in the future. As for me, my research, uh, you know, I am in the, uh, in the business of uh, identifying uh, genes that are associated with human uh, disorders. Yes. And we study uh, 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 movement disorders and extreme forms of obesity in our research. So, uh, right now, uh, we have established uh, the uh, largest DNA bank uh, of the Turkish population here. So this is a tremendous... Uh, uh, achievement is <laughs> this is a tremendous uh, resource. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're planning to build up on this, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, now also uh, uh, large-scale data genome information is in the uh, heart of everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope to be able to do uh, able to identify more disease-associated genes in the uh, coming years. That was actually one of my questions. Do you, do you have any, uh, any disorders in mind that could, be, could turn out to be a gene genetic disorder rather than an environment or environmental one? Yeah, definitely. To actually uh, understand whether a disease is genetic or not, we look at the what is called as heritability ratio. Mm -hmm. And this heritability ratio is very high for complex diseases as well. Complex diseases meaning very frequently observed disorders. Yeah. And one of the main problems right now affecting humans is obesity. Yes, definitely. Uh, actually, World Health Organization now puts obesity ahead of smoking oh. as a risk factor. This is number one risk factor it's right now. Yeah. Then comes smoking. So, and we know that the heritability index of obesity is uh, very high. People are genetically predisposed to this. So, uh, I hope to be able to uncover uh, obesity genes in the uh, future. Yeah. Um, I have seen that in one of your papers you mentioned that there is a sleep phase disorder that results from sleep phase disorder. Sleep phase, okay, um, this is, okay. And it comes from this CRY1 yes. uh, gene. And also you 
they should associate the same gene with the with the ADHD. Do, is there some sort of connection there, or uh, am I am I missing something? Okay, I think this was one of the most exciting projects that I did in my uh, career, and it is actually based on a novel approach to identify a disease-associated genes. Okay. In the classical approach, you choose a disease, mm -hmm. diabetes, schizophrenia, yeah. uh, hypertension, whatever the disease is. Then you go and find patients with that disease, of course. and then you analyze the genomes of these patients mm -hmm. to find the disease gene. Yeah. This is the normal effort. This is done all over. This is the way to find the disease gene. Yeah. As we were studying obesity and making the, the largest Turkish uh, cohort mm -hmm. of sequenced individuals, a DNA bank of these people, one day it occurred to me that actually we can reverse this process. You know how reverse engineering is done? Yeah, yeah right. We can do reverse phenotyping. Meaning, <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. we have now a bank of DNA sequences. And we have also the knowledge of the genes from the Human Genome Project. Mm -hmm. So, and we have a lot of biochemistry experiments around the world that tells us what genes are doing. So I thought in this respect, actually, the circadian rhythm, our biological clock, mm -hmm. is a very good target. Because, I said, what kind of a disease would one expect if the biological clock is not functioning properly? Yeah, of course. Sleep. Sleep. And I thought yeah. sleep should be the <laughs> first to. target. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you look into the population, I mean, more than 10% or 20% of the individuals have sleep disorders. <laughs> that's, that's true. So it is not rare. Yes. Yeah. So then I said, now instead of me going to the sleep clinics mm -hmm. and asking for patients who have sleep disorders, I will go to my existing DNA bank. Ah, yes. Because one fifth should be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and look for mutations mm -hmm. in circadian rhythm. Yeah. And you did. And we looked and we, sure enough, yeah. we had some people who had those uh, crooked looking <laughs> <laughs> genes. Yes. <laughs> Mutations, as, we, as I should say. <laughs> and then next thing I said, now let's, I mean, I, this person came to me for another reason. And we never asked him when he came, do you sleep well or not? <laughs> so then I took the telephone mm -hmm. and I said, hello, my dear, do you have sleep problems? <laughs> 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 That's actually the fun part. <laughs> and I was almost dropping, I was sitting on this chair. Mm -hmm. The first lady I called told me, oh, of course, mm -hmm. I am a nurse and I always uh, take uh, night shifts because I can't sleep at night. Yeah. And uh, I was, you know, I couldn't believe that it, I, I hit it. You, you hit it, but it also shaped the life of, of the person, yes. which is the interesting part. Yes. It shaped, of course, it shaped the life of the person, of course. As, then I called the second individual, and that one also told, oh, I, uh, I sleep at 4 a.m. in the morning, and I can't get up until uh, noon. Wow. And uh, then this was the beginning of the story. Mm -hmm. So this is reverse phenotyping. 
this is an entirely new approach for uh, identifying a disease gene. So I wrote this uh, as a hypothesis, uh, first in nature uh, genetics. This is a, mm -hmm. one of our uh, important uh, journals, mm -hmm. uh, and they accepted it. Mm -hmm. And then immediately afterwards, we've uh, shown that uh, it is uh, indeed applicable and sleep phenotype. Sleep yeah. is a very complex human behavior, and complex human behaviors and identifying genes associated with human behavior is really actually really difficult. Yes. And we, using genetic approaches, we found the molecular basis of sleep disorders and actually cell, again, our uh, top uh, journal, chose it as the uh, one of the most significant, one of the ten most significant scientific developments in 2017, and the story didn't end here. As I would expect, yes. As we now, the way I work mm -hmm. is we don't wait for the patients to come to us. Yeah. We go to the patients. And you're entirely there with the complete virtual work. And we visit these families mm -hmm. in their home environments. So I travel with my uh, students and my uh, colleagues mm -hmm. to all over Turkey. We travel. Uh, and when we visited these families in their homes, mm -hmm. I noticed that they have a psychiatric problem also. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist, so, I mean, I have my ideas about their psychiatric condition, but it is not a You're professional not approach. Yes. I'm not an expert on this. Yeah, yeah. So I went to uh, my colleagues at Ankara Medical School, two mm -hmm. psychiatry professors, and I went to two of them because I want to, to them to get their, uh, get their feedback independently. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> if there is individual in psychiatry, everything is very complicated. Of course, of course. I mean, an easy uh, hypertension is, or obesity is people are obese. Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> hypertension is you just get the blood pressure and you see the hypertension. But yeah. psychiatric disorders, disorders are yeah. very complex. That's why two different psychiatrists, and do, do they come up to the same conclusion mm -hmm. blindly? So, the psychiatrists, of course, didn't tell me, go away. They said, <laughs> <laughs> because they are very busy people, you know. Yeah, yeah I can imagine, but if the type of mystery comes to your door, you wouldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but they were convinced. Yeah. And they traveled with me, again, to all these different uh, places, Urfa, Kayseri, Konya, uh, Fethiye, you know, these families were, and they both said, these people have ADHD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, we got the DSM-5. DSM-5 is the uh, Psychiatric manual. Association's yeah. uh, international manual for uh, diagnosing psychiatric disorders. This time, they began their formal analysis, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, then, uh, for sure, uh, they and it is already known that in many psychiatric diseases, including ADHD, sleep is disturbed. Oh yeah, this is a clinical observation. Mm -hmm. Of course, we didn't stop here. I went to my colleagues in Italy, mm -hmm. uh, and I said. Uh, Look, you also have a DNA bank like I have, yeah. and uh, uh, can you find out the uh, cryptochrome 1 mutants in the Italian population? Mm -hmm. And my friend said, oh sure, and then she just <laughs> opened her computer so easily, and she just, what was the mutation, and I told her, and she typed, and she said, Oh, we have someone Giuseppe living in London, and we have in the town of in Italy somewhere another one, and mm -hmm. another one, another one, another <laughs> one. And I said, "Wonderful! Now find me a 
an Italian psychiatrist. Okay. And she found an Italian psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And then we contacted the families. Yeah. And these, we didn't tell the psychiatrist what kind of a genetic uh, psychiatric disorder this would be. Mm -hmm. But these psychiatrists also came with the same result. Awesome. So, so when I saw that in two different populations this is confirmed, then we can start thinking about publishing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, But as a last resort, I went to my colleagues in uh, New York in, at Mount Sinai Hospital, and they have access to the Biome Data Bank. Biome Data Bank is the largest U.S. population-based data bank. Okay. And, uh, and this is a DNA bank that contains both the phenotype and the genotype, the gene sequence and the medical conditions of people. Oh. Yeah. And this is a very controlled database, of course. It is not open to uh, people, so only authorized people can look into this database. And we conducted what is called the phenome-wide analysis study, FIVAS study, mm -hmm. which is another independent uh, genetic-based uh, study. And there again, uh, we found that they have uh, an increased number of psychiatric disorders in the database. Mm -hmm. So we published. And this year, actually one month ago, uh, the Chinese uh, investigators now published the animal model of our mutation. Yeah. This means they introduced the disease, the, ident the mutation in the cryptochrome 1 gene, mm -hmm. exact mutation, they put it into mouse. Okay. And the mouse have ADHD. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was over, over the moon the, yeah. uh, when I saw this stage. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I can imagine a future where Actually, doctors called in individuals like you. You did, saying you apparently have this disorder. Let's let's treat you. Come and let's treat you. Could this be the uh, doctor uh, concept in the future? Look, let me tell you this. Let's say uh, an individual mm -hmm. goes for MRI scan. Yeah. And the scan is done. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the scan is uh, for uh, intestinal hernia, okay. let's say. But when the doctor looks at the scan, he or she sees a tumor in the uh, liver. Yeah. We call this incidental finding. Yeah. Now, the purpose of your scan is hernia, mm -hmm. but you see a tumor. Yeah. Will you say, oh, I did the scan for hernia, mm -hmm. I didn't do it for tumor, so I will not tell the patient. <laughs> yeah, of course not. I mean, <laughs> this is an ethical problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of, of course. The thing is, <laughs> when you sequence the DNA of an individual for a given disorder, you actually have the information of the entire genome. So you identify lots of things. That result is right in front of you. How can you ignore this? The, the question then becomes, would you advise people to get their DNA sequence so that they can know about their um, future diseases. diseases. This is an entirely uh, individual uh, decision. Yeah, of course. So, of course, you need to tell the patient. You can ask the patient, uh, when we sequence your DNA for disease A, mm -hmm. we will get information about all the other diseases. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to learn about them, or you don't want to learn about them? And if that person says, I don't want to learn about them, then you don't. How common is that response? I wouldn't think it would be super common, but... Uh, people, the overwhelming majority of the people want to know. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I would predict. But did you did you have any difficulty where people didn't want to give their DNA sequences for the research, even though um, even though it's reasonable to actually do? In my experience, I mean, I have now seen uh, thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. uh, when you approach them. Uh, and you build a, a trust with that person, uh, they are accepting the uh, genetic testing. If someone, uh, like a uh, provocative agent, provokes that person, mm -hmm. then they become afraid. <laughs> yes. But, I mean, we have... Uh, uh, also, uh, vaccine deniers. Oh yeah, yeah. So, when they politicize a scientific issue, mm -hmm. that's what happens. That's what. If the scientific issue remains as scientific issue, then no problem. I see. Um, so, what are the big, big questions you have in mind about human genome sequencing? Except maybe you mentioned. 98% um, of the genome, except that what are the big questions that you have in mind to maybe tackle in the future or uh, suggest others to tackle? Of course, uh, an area, I mean, first of all, these are very um, difficult questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, predicting for the future, <laughs> uh, is inherently a futile attempt. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you can be creative about that, so it's also fun. Uh, of course, um, uh, lifespan, mm -hmm. longevity, understanding the uh, molecular basis of longevity is a very uh, important uh, yeah. scientific uh, question. Also, understanding uh, psychiatry dis psychiatric disorders how the mind works yeah, that's, that's the biggest is one. a super <laughs> difficult challenge yeah. I think I can put these two uh, immediately yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, do you are you gonna tackle do you at least have in mind a specific disorder in psychi psychiatry that you think is going to be in the genome. Except, oh, it is already... Except the known ones. Uh, it's already... Uh, so in this respect, actually, you asked me the distinction between uh, psychiatric disorders versus personality traits. Ah, yes. These are two different uh, yeah, things. I, yeah, actually. That's what you <laughs> asked me. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in psychiatric disorders, right now, the difficulty is classifying the psychiatric disorders based on clinical parameters. Mm -hmm. Meaning, one doctor says bipolar disorder, yes. the other doctor says depression. Identifying them is hard enough. It right is. Now. Yes. And this is, it is, I don't say that the, one of the doctors doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. The diseases themselves are episodic. One day they are fine, the other day they are not yeah. fine, and they come with different symptoms. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have a lot of diagnostic uncertainty in psychiatric disorders. Yeah. I think to solve this eventually will depend on Analyzing the genes. Yeah, of course. It will help a lot. Personality traits. This is even more uh, difficult uh, because they are subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are now uh, studies that are conducted actually uh, on uh, one million people, for example. Mm -hmm. Right now, Actually, let me tell you this, uh, England and uh, United States started two very significant projects. Okay. In Britain, it is Genomics England, mm -hmm. 
in US, it's all of us, it's called. Okay. And this is to sequence all newborn babies uh, right. and build up a database mm -hmm. and get their genetic and phenotype, disease information, health information together so that we can inter interpret the most difficult, I, I mean, we can question and interpret the most complex uh, health issue problems. Yes. I think this will, this will it's be... It's going to be great. It's going to be, yes, <laughs> revolutionary. Yeah. Um, a specific question for you would be, um, you, you, focused on the on the diseases and disorders more than the for example prosperous parts of the of humans maybe intelligence or creativity um, those features are also rare like diseases but uh, you can actually find genetic correlates maybe why did you specifically focus on disorders rather than the mm, the others you know i tried uh, in 2012, now 11 years ago, uh, when genome sequencing uh, became uh, uh, possible uh, yeah, technologically. technologically, of course, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. and mm -hmm. discussing with Mary Claire King, uh, who discovered the breast cancer gene. She's a very good friend of uh, Bill Kent University, and she has uh, excellent uh, uh, co-workers who are uh, Turkish people from uh, Bill Kent. Uh, and uh, we thought, uh, she told me, Typhoon, what are you going to do next? And I said, Marie Claire, what are you going to do next? And we said, why don't, why, we are always after the negative. <laughs> Why don't we go after the positive? Mm -hmm. Now, intellect is very difficult to touch. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, if you touch it, you're going to change everything. It's a very <laughs> uh, difficult issue. Yeah. But sure enough, we found another innocent, I mean, not so uh, polarizing <laughs> yes. subject. This is perfect pitch. Yeah. The perfect pitch mm -hmm. is, you know, having the uh, you get ear, the sound and you identify the you notes. You ident identify the notes, mm -hmm. and actually there is uh, from zero to twelve, mm -hmm. and people who are one, two, three, four are tone deaf. You know, they mm -hmm. go to a concert, they listen, but they don't actually <laughs> <laughs> hear the melody anything. Yeah, but they are tone deaf, and then there is the most of us are in the middle, mm -hmm. and then there are some people who are 9, 10, yeah. and then 11 and 12, there is a very little proportion of the population that is pitch perfect. Yes. So, I went to the music faculty, mm -hmm. and I said, you have so many talented young people, I'm sure uh, you have uh, some people with perfect pitch. Actually, yeah. uh, there are tests to quantify perfect mm -hmm. pitch, which is very helpful. Yeah, of course. And, yeah, uh, and uh, I said, uh, let's identify these people and analyze their genomes and uh, find out uh, what, the genes are. what the genes are. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they were also very interested. Uh, at first, at but first. at first, <laughs> but uh, later on, uh, it became uh, very difficult. I mean, we just couldn't reach to the people. They don't have a problem, medical problem, so there is no incentive uh, yeah. to uh, do that. And the uh, families, and also, funding is very important. Yes, of course. You know, I'm telling you, but the OB research that we are conducting right now mm -hmm. uh, is uh, supported with, uh, right, this phase is supported with $7 million. I see. 
the previous phase of building up the Turkish uh, very own database mm -hmm. cost about ten million dollars. Oh. This is a <laughs> and uh, finding support is also very difficult. And yeah. obesity is such a big health problem that there it are gets there are yeah it gets yeah. funding. So yeah, I see. Yes. But nobody really cares uh, about the <laughs> about the positives. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see. I see. Maybe in the future it's going to become possible as the as the yes funding is not really yes. needed. Yes. Well, maybe available. We will see. Maybe in the future. I think so. I mean, definitely. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, we, we now hear SMA stories. You, you also hear from these babies with spinal muscular atrophy. Oh, yeah. SMA, 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 mm -hmm. and it costs so much money to treat these babies. It's such a big problem. It is from an economical point of view. The numbers mm -hmm. don't allow us to treat all these children. I mean, our entire economy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the health related, yes. if you give it to, the only possibility is to diagnose these carriers in the first yeah. place, yeah. which now our countries are moving in that direction. Actually, this will become the mainstream approach. Mm -hmm. And eventually, although not yet, mm -hmm. but eventually in our country, it will be like genomic England or the All of Us projects, uh -huh. where uh, the entire populations will be sequenced. Okay. Yes. And if we have good enough databases in our country, if we can build them, then mining that data for discovery of novel phenotypes, including positive phenotypes, uh -huh. uh, should be possible. Hopefully. Okay. Um, you have also found some susceptibility increasing genes for COVID-19. Oh, yes. Um, that's also very, very important. Uh, can we, in the future again, correct our uh, genetic code at least to get immune to all possible viruses even before they come, like COVID-19? Should we produce every possible vaccines? for that purpose. Okay. The way you ask the question has deep implications. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, in the first part you said, can we, through DNA sequencing, identify individuals who are predisposed to uh, infectious diseases like COVID-19, mm -hmm. and can we change the genetic makeup of such people so that they are not uh, uh, susceptible to that disorder? Yes. I, yes. Your, what you said, maybe you didn't use, you didn't say it explicitly, <laughs> clearly yes. as I put it, yeah. but your wording implied. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And I'll tell you the general problem right now that we are facing as humanity. Uh, when you try to do good, you may sometimes do bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's sometimes a problem. Kaş yaparken göz çıkar. What happens is AIDS. Some people never get AIDS. Mm -hmm. Although they are exposed to AIDS, they never get it. Yeah. Because they are lacking a specific receptor mm -hmm. that is on the surface of the uh, immune system cells okay. that the virus binds. Interesting. Right. So, it's like a Teflon coating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those cells, the virus comes and falls off. Can't enter the cell. Yeah. So these people are immune to a, uh, HIV. Mm -hmm. So they said, why don't we change the genetic makeup of the people so that they become resistant to AIDS? Mm -hmm. This is, of course, the number one 
issue, ethical issue, yes. can you change the germ bank? Mm -hmm. And it is no, no, everybody. But still, someone did it. Ah, right. <laughs> Who? A Chinese scientist. Ah, yes, <laughs> yeah. And then later on, it became clear that people who lack this receptor mm -hmm. and therefore are resistant to AIDS have a short life span. They die so, early. Oh no. It affects uh, longevity. I see. Multipurpose genes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, your so current information mm -hmm. and you try to do something with it, but you mess yeah. up with an entirely different thing. Yeah. Evolution did not occur overnight. Oh, yes. It is yes. generations and generations and generations that we are. Definitely. So therefore, our knowledge at this time mm -hmm. is not so strong to be interventionalist. I see. I see. But it's uh, it's still a question. In the second question I asked. Uh, should we produce, produce every possible vaccines, meaning we might be able to identify what kind of viruses can infect us, meaning we can produce the vaccines for such viruses even before they come out. Of course. Basically. The American government said uh, we are opening a new grant program mm -hmm. and we will give $30 million to researchers yeah. Uh, to identify models for emerging pathogens. I see. Emer the diseases that have not occurred yet, mm -hmm. but can you find, uh, can you start thinking about this yeah. and make possible scenarios mm -hmm. and start working at the molecular level how to overcome those uh, pathogens? And uh, there are such funding programs right now in the world. Uh, I was trying to get your opinion because um, it's also tricky to uh, say that there is this possible virus, that everybody knows that possible virus, which means they can produce that virus now, even though you are vaccine, vaccinizing people, that could be a problem again. That's why I was trying to ask the ethical implications and your idea about the... You know, I mean, you are you asking me, I think, if I understand it correctly, you're asking me about uh, bioterrorism. Kind of, kind of. Using, for example, viruses to create uh, pathogens mm -hmm. that affect uh, humans uh, and... What I'm kind of uh, implying is from the research of the USA, there could be bioterrorism uh, becoming more prevalent because people are researching, but the, the knowledge they are getting should be kept very um, intact. I mean, you know, Einstein famously said, uh, I'm not sure whether the universe is indefinite. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure <laughs> human stupidity is indefinite. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think this is the this yeah. is the answer. And for sure, it is possible to weaponize. I mean, uh, let's not be uh, 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 playing Pollyanna. It, yeah. it is uh, it is uh, possible. Uh, the thing is. This type of thing cannot be population specific. You cannot say, I will wipe out the Africans from this uh, uh, yeah. world, or I will yeah, wipe not. out the Turks from this world, or I will of wipe course. out the Germans from this, whatever. <laughs> but, yeah. This is not, because as a human species, our evolutionary background mm -hmm. is not so long. So, it doesn't matter if you are a Chinese, mm -hmm. or an Argentinian, or an African, yeah. the genetic distance is not too much. That's true. So, we evolved only during the 150,000 years or so. We don't have a big uh, 
past behind us. We are not isolated anymore. Uh, so therefore, whatever the uh, malicious thing that you will uh, generate, mm -hmm. everyone will be affected. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, this is more about the, you. You actually mentioned this throughout, but there is this um, question of how do you get from a specific idea, a creative one maybe, to publishing an entire article? What is the most difficult thing for you in the process? And how do you overcome the challenges? Of course, the scientific process is a tedious one. Mm -hmm. And in uh, conducting science, you don't, you don't fall into love with your idea. Yes. Whenever you have an idea, a hypothesis, mm -hmm. and you get experimental data that supports it, you try to kill it. Yes. This is the process. If it doesn't die, despite your attempts from every possible direction, then it is presentable to the scientific society. Yeah. So therefore, you should be the best critic of your own. Here, of course, teamwork is also extremely important and that your team and yourself, you should trust each other mm -hmm. and also work under ethical conditions. You don't falsify, you don't produce data uh, based on uh, 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 falsified data and uh, so so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then uh, and in most of the instances, what I have observed is, uh, let's say first of all this basic notion: you cannot ask Columbus to discover America. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because if you say discover America for me, it means you've been there before or you, <laughs> you know about that place before and you can say yes. visit America for me, not discover. <laughs> In science, you make a prediction, you set out experiments to see your hypothesis, but usually the real breakthroughs come from unexpected directions. I mean, to give you the, in my career, for example, uh, what is the significant discovery that we made was the discovery of prader willi syndrome gene in 1992, this was. Mm -hmm. My project was to discover the red syndrome gene. Yeah. But I never discovered the red syndrome gene and I discovered what no one else discovered before, the prader willi syndrome gene. During the process, in obesity research, oh. we started <laughs> to look for the obesity genes, but during the process, suddenly it occurred to me that we can do actually reverse phenotyping, which led me to the sleep gene. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, in a football match, you don't say that uh, the uh, uh, player is going to get the ball at minute three and throw it with so many degrees angle to his friend, to his teammate, and then he will, at the three minutes, 53 seconds, <laughs> kick it, yes. and then it will be a, a score. Yeah. No. You are on the field, you are trained, your condition is enough to run for 90 minutes, uh, and uh, then... You discover along the way. So this is also sciences in many instances, uh, during this process, breakthroughs come. Projects can be conducted in a predictable manner. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 
groundbreaking scientific discovery, revelations that no one else uh, noticed before. Yeah. 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 Thank you for answering, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are running out of time, so uh, you have been doing such a creative and such a such an incredible life. Thank you so much for coming again. Ah. And it was very nice to meet you. Ah, it's my pleasure. Uh, I also thank you very much.